Hello, everybody. Welcome. We're excited to have with us today is Tom Skazzi at uh, TerraCycle. Tom is CEO and founder of TerraCycle. We're going to be having a conversation about sustainability, learn a little bit more about the topic and more about the people who are in the field. Tom, thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule to talk to us today. Thanks for having me. Tom, we'll start with our toughest question. Uh, when we think about sustainability, sometimes the concept can be overwhelming and confusing for some. What does business sustainability mean to you? That's a good question. Um, so I, I'm not giving you a direct answer because uh, uh, I think we have to take a step back and say, to me, you know, sustainability, because you said business sustainability, to me, sustainability is when we are in balance with the earth, right? That the earth is not being strained by our existence. And so that is the fun, that is to me fundamental sustainability. And then there's a journey towards that. A part of that could be like circular economy. It could be regenerative, you know, uh, practices, you know, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, uh, this idea of balance uh, 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 is very important, which also means that we probably have to shrink the size of business to achieve that. Okay. Uh, when you shrink, do you mean shrink the overall size of what business are doing or shrink the impact that they're having on earth? on the earth? I think the only way to shrink the, Im the answer is yes, we have to shrink the impact, but to shrink the impact to an enough, to a, a degree enough to, to, to make it the right amount, we probably also have to shrink the size. Okay. Uh, do you kind of have an idea of how much shrink, you know, we, we probably well, need I'll give to, you this example, right? That'd like, uh, um, starting in, you know, we started consuming more than the earth could regenerate in the late 1970s just to put it into perspective, right? And since then, we've been uh, going way, way, way beyond. And so, you know, what we need to think about is, is how do we, and we, we vote for this as citizens, how do we significantly lower our total net consumption to a reasonable level? Because right now we are gouging on consumption. And to give you a sense of the numbers, I mean, an average female consumer 100 years ago would buy two apparel items per year, and they would have lasted her 20 years before those items would have been disposed. Today, the same consumer buys 66 apparel items per year and wears them on average three times before disposal, and there's 10 times more people. So you see my point, it doesn't matter how um, low impact it is to make all that clothing. Even if it was all reused, it would still be too much clothing, right? So we have to both uh, make sure that what we buy is much more sustainable and circular and those type of examples, but we have to also buy way less. I think the really what the numbers you used helped the two to I think it was 66 uh, items per year compared to two. I think that really helps put this exponential growth that we've seen. Uh, it's multiple times exponential. I mean, it is. And then you also have to note that it's not just that per capita. There's also 10 times more people. Right. So the human population, like, like if you think of it normalized for population, it's two apparel items going to closer to like 700 apparel items per year. And that's just apparel. Absolutely. I think that, so that's, that's wonderful. And I really like kind of the numbers that help us put in, in place. Yes. Uh, so I got to kind of know you through TerraCycle and I know a lot of us uh, see TerraCycle on the packaging and that's really kind of e e exploded in growth as well, where we see it on the back. For those that don't know, do you mind uh, telling us a little bit about TerraCycle and what you folks do as a company? Absolutely. So TerraCycle is a mission-driven waste management company. We've been around for two decades, operating now in 22 countries. And uh, what we do is three things. Uh, the first, which is what we're most known for, what you had just mentioned, is we help create recycling programs for those materials that are today hard to recycle. Everything from cosmetic waste and oral care waste, all the way to dirty diapers and coffee capsules, cigarette butts, chewing gum, you name it. Our second division focuses on how do we integrate waste back into products? So helping you know, brands like Head & Shoulders make their bottles from ocean plastic, and many, many other examples. And then our third division uh, operates under a brand we created called Loop, which is about how to shift consumption from being single use uh, or disposable packaging or disposable products to reusable uh, products and packages. And this is working with all the world's biggest brands and retailers to effectively bring out uh, 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 the ability to consume in a highly reusable fashion. Perfect. So uh, I know we've talked about uh, Loop quite a bit before. I'd, I'd like to kind of push and ask you, uh, I, I know you uh, see the value of the the packaging itself, where if I consider now uh, uh, orange juice, I know Tropicana is one of the brands. So if I, you know, you buy maybe an orange, uh, orange juice in a plastic container yes. that maybe hopefully you, I put in the recycling bill, uh, hopefully it's not recycling. So hopefully it does end up getting recycled through uh, somewhere. But, uh, you know, how much they spend on 
making that and how I kind of consume the product and how that changes now when we talk about loop and if sure. it's in loop packaging. Absolutely. So let's take the Tropicana example. So today you may buy Tropicana in, let's say, a plastic bottle. And uh, when you're done, you absolutely will put it in your recycling bin and a very good chance it will be recycled. Let's just say, I'm making up numbers. Let's say that plastic bottle cost Tropicana 25 cents to make. This is a made up number. Whatever you paid for your orange juice, the cost of that package is in the price of your orange juice at 100%. And in fact, you own the bottle when you're done. You can do anything you want with it. It's your property. Funny how you give it away to a recycling bin, right? Just, you know, as a sort of point of irony. In, uh, in Loop, Tropicana, which you'll see launch later this year, uh, goes into, uh, in their example, a beautiful glass bottle. So higher quality, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, let's say that glass bottle, I'm making it up, costs 50 cents to mix. Maybe it's more expensive. What actually goes into the price of your orange juice is not the glass, the, the entire price. It's the depreciation of the bottle. So how many times they think it's going to go around. Let's say if they think it's going to go around 20 times, it's 50 cents over 20 or like two cents and change. Uh, and whatever it costs us to collect and clean it. That's the apples to apples comparison. And this way, without spending more on your orange juice, you can experience a much more beautiful, more aesthetic uh, and more sustainable package. Uh, and then instead of putting it in a recycling bin, you put it in a loop reuse bin at the end. And uh, kind of following with these numbers, I'd probably get more uh, orange juice for my buck, right? I'd get more value because that, you know, that 20 cents is a little bit less on depreciation over time, plus it's the better point. container, right? It, 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 yeah. So I don't, in some cases, uh, you know, it's not necessarily always going to be money savings, but it's not going to cost you more. Um, and you get a much better uh, experience. It's both uh, more beautiful, most, more aesthetic, maybe even healthier, but also more sustainable. And, and so this is a perfect example kind of where we see it might not cost you anymore, but it's better for the environment and more right. sustainable long term. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, so now we know a little bit more about TerraCycle and Loop. Do you mind telling us a little bit about your career journey, how you ended up founding this company and kind of how do you convince others to s invest in it and see the value of sustainability from a business perspective at the end? Of yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, my journey, I was born in, in Hungary, which is only relevant because it was still communist at the time. And then I, you know, we left and long story short, I went to university in the United States. So went from communism to capitalism. And uh, I fell in love with entrepreneurship, you know, in high school. But to be honest, for selfish reasons, you know, I figured it was a ticket to fame and fortune, which, you know, it's sort of like the embodiment of the American dream. And I've luckily been able to achieve that. Um, uh, but I had this big turning point in my freshman year of college. One of the first classes I attended was Economics 101. And the professor gets up on stage and asks, what's the purpose of business? I'm actually just for fun, curious, how would you answer that question if you um, were? The purpose of business is to help so uh, society and the economy grow. Uh, rather, I think what we are now, a lot of people would say the, the purpose of business is to maximize shareholder, shareholder wealth, which I really think we yeah. need to evolve beyond that. But I, but I bet that's the answer he gave you, right? The answer was, the, was exactly that, maximize profit to shareholders. Yeah. But I felt like it should be more what you answered. What does it do to make the world better, right? And then to me, profit is an indicator of health, critically important. But in, in other words, if you're profitable, you're going to flourish and grow and you're healthy. And if you're not profitable, it's being unhealthy. You're going to shrink and die one day and go bankrupt. And so isn't like profit isn't the reason of being, it's an indicator of how strong you are, how healthy you are. Like, like, like for us, you know, the state of our health, right? But we don't live to be healthy. We're healthy to live. And so I wanted to find the business idea that was for profit, uh, but that, you know, was really there to make the world better. And I fell in love with garbage and, you know, basically left school a year later. And that's been almost 20 years ago because garbage is full of such amazing anomalies, right? So for example, we live in a very materialistic world where we, you know, in no small part, our status in society is directly linked to how much accumulated stuff we have. But isn't it weird that everything we own will one day be property of a garbage company? I mean, everything, the, you know, from the clothing on our backs to the things our ceilings and our homes are made from, you know, our walls, our floors, everything will one day belong to a garbage company. Um, it's also the only material that has negative raw material value. And for how insanely big of a concept this is, an industry that will own everything, it's incredibly uninnovative. In fact, the least innovative industry per dollar of revenue it enjoys. So to me, it's like an entrepreneur's dream, especially a purposeful sort of entrepreneurship dream. Wonderful. I, I, I think kind of if you push on this, um, we rarely talk about this idea of a circular value chain and that's growing. And that's really where 
uh, we're starting to see the value you can extract from waste. W would you define yes. it or look at it a little bit differently as, as you think about kind of waste um, innovation? So I think it's very interesting, right? Like the, the, the traditional um, approach to garbage is to see value only in one place. What is the material physically worth? Right, like when someone recycles an aluminum can, the reason it's recyclable is that aluminum is valuable, right? And the, the value of the aluminum is enough to cover the cost of collecting it and processing it, which is why we can recycle it. And so traditional waste management is really focused on if there's value in waste, the only value is the material value. And if there's no value in waste, then it's what's the cheapest way I can get rid of it, like put it in a landfill or burn it or something. That's the, that's it. That's the economic equation. But I think what's so exciting about garbage is that there's a lot of other ways you can tease out value like, and, and that's the entire principle of our business. So for example, if you're a retailer, especially now after COVID, when you're, everyone's gone online and you're now opening up your stores again, you know, maybe you're in a region of the world, which is, you know, opening back up, you need foot traffic. Now we run recycling programs at many retailers and what they like about these recycling programs is it drives foot traffic into the store because people want to drop off whatever the object is, cosmetics or contact lenses, you name it, at the store. And that's actually the value there that they monetize. It's not the value of the cosmetic waste, but that the cosmetic waste recycling enables foot traffic. That's an example. Or And there's a whole plethora of ways to tease out value. Um, a, a new division we're creating uh, 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 is our diagnostic division, which has the thesis that certain waste streams carry diagnosable samples, like your air conditioned filter carries a sample of the dirt in your air, your water filter, you know, like your Brita, uh, uh, a sample of the dirt in your water, your child's diaper, a fecal sample, right, and so on. And so all those examples I just listed off, you'll see soon launching uh, uh, capabilities where you will be able to send in one diaper from your child and we'll send you back a report on the status of your child's health based on the fecal sample and the microbiome that's deposited in the fecal sample. So initially, you know, we think of, uh, I love this expansion. We, we Think of recyclable for the con for the value. So the aluminum, I think, is a perfect example. Uh, this diagnostic value or additional value beyond just the material itself, whether it's bringing yes. more people to the stores or, 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 or diagnostic information. But uh, you folks are really involved in recycling a lot of things that we don't consider are recyclable or are yeah, not yes. economically recyclable. So, I mean, that's right. how do you make that work? It's a very good question. And uh we make it work by asking a stakeholder, uh, could be the manufacturer who made it, the retailer who sold it, maybe even the factory it came from or some stakeholder that cares about that waste stream to say, would you fund the actual cost of recycling that waste, uh, which, is the, uh, which is the cost of collecting it and processing it minus whatever the results are worth, would you pay for that? And uh, once we get them to say yes, then that allows us to set it up. And the reason we get them to say yes is we figure out how they can benefit from doing that, which is all that other type of value, right? And the more of that value we can show, the more they're willing to lean in and fund it. And that's the business logic to our entire business. So kind of building on that, we, we see a lot of companies kind of being involved in extractive industries, this take, make, waste Mm -hmm. uh, uh, loop rather than closing the, uh, uh, the 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 loop and going circular value chain where they realize the value add whether it's information or something whatever comes from the waste uh, so w what do you think needs to happen for companies to understand that or, or, or people to, to understand and see the value in it i think um so there's you know you can look at that from the negative right which is risk you know like if you don't solve the waste problem your product may be legislated away like straws being banned or plastic bags being banned and there's more of that coming or other forms of legislation not just bans but taxes being passed like extended products responsibility taxes so that's more or like consumers being pissed off or, you know about it that's more protecting against the risk everyone sort of sees that but the real magic is to highlight how you can win by voluntarily, because you're not legally obligated yet, voluntarily solving for that particular waste stream. And that to me is the real magic where it's done from positive, not done from negative, right? Not from fear, but from opportunity. So uh, I like this kind of this win on the value of the waste stream or understanding the, the win from the value of the waste stream. What can companies do to start to understand where they can win or, or what the value add would be f for their waste streams? Sure. Um, I think what they, the, the key thing to think about, right, is to look at all the different metrics, many it's completely unintuitive, 
um, that could benefit by having, say, a recycling program for that stream. And think about everyone. Like, could it, I give you some examples. Does it help you retain more employees or more team members, good talent, if you have a company that's showing that they are collecting and recycling, you know, their, their material that may actually help you retain. And we've seen that actually play out. How will it help you with your consumer stakeholders? Will it help them become more loyal? Will it help them switch from brand X into your brand? Uh, will it help drive more traffic? You know, that's the, the consumer stakeholder. How will it help your vendors? You know, and, and you start thinking about each of these stakeholders and then really think through the lens of how can those stakeholders benefit uh, from this type of activity? So really it comes down to just uh, more information and better, better understanding how to leverage that information? Uh, yes, and sort of to think about the value in unintuitive ways. Uh, do you want and to give I say, us an example? Well, that's what I, this is oh, it. Like, so the, not, that's the, 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 yeah, exactly what I was just mentioning, okay. because the only intuitive way people think about it, they say, well, if I'm going to collect and recycle the pen you're holding, then what's the value of the plastic that pen is made from? And is that plastic valuable enough for me to bother collecting it? Right. Okay. But uh, uh, maybe if I, you know, like maybe that when that pen runs out of ink and I tell you, hey, um, uh, you have now two choices of pens you can buy. You can buy one that's just as not recyclable as the pen maybe that you have, or here's a company like BIC who is offering pen recycling and you can choose their pen. Maybe you're gonna choose theirs. Well, a company like BIC then sees value because you've chosen theirs instead of someone else's. It's these examples that are, or let's say you're in an office, right? And you have that used pen and you decide to fund for your employees pen recycling right? Maybe you buy a zero waste box from us and there's now you, and you tell your team members that, hey, we, our office is going to recycle all the pens. Does that make your team members happier? And do they decide to stick around longer? This Wonderful. is what I mean by unintuitive value. Okay. So this, these, it really takes companies a, a rethink of their stakeholders and understanding kind of beyond, really break, think out the box for lack of a better word of. Yes, because we don't happen. want you to do it because you think it's just the right thing to do to recycle a pen. And the reason that we don't want you to do it for that reason is that's not a sticky reason, okay? right? What if, what if business gets tight? What if uh, budgets have to be cut? The first things that are cut are that type of activity. But if there is actual uh, measurable value, then those things don't get cut. And, they can, and if it's in a good time, that's protecting us at the bottom. If we're protecting us at the top when things are flourishing, then it grows and expands and becomes incredibly big. Perfect. I, you know, if you don't mind, we'll kind of go back to the loop model as sure. you talk about the value, the value out of this. And so if you think yeah. of the consumer, uh, do you think that, you know, thinking of the model you've developed at loop, do you think we're going to start seeing this in other industries or play out in other, other I ways? I think so. I don't want to, there's no silver bullet in sustainability other than not purchasing. That is actually the only silver bullet, right? Uh, um, it's purchasing less. Not purchasing is too much of an absolutist point, right? We have to buy food, we have to have clothing, but you, we can purchase way less, right? Okay. Now, um, so within anything outside that, there is no silver bullet. Um, and I don't want to say reuses for everything. And I'm going to tell you where it is and where it isn't appropriate. But the answer is absolutely to your question. So Loop began where there is the biggest garbage crisis today, which is what you will call FMCG or fast moving consumer goods. That's your package beverage, package food, home care, personal care products. So with the tides of, oh, sorry, the P&Gs of the world, the Nestle's of the world, those sort of companies and a hundred others, that's what we are uh, uh, focused on first and foremost. And if you look at Loop, you'll see that's you know what's out. The next major category that we now have public partnerships with is QSR, or quick serve restaurants, uh, like McDonald's or uh, Burger King or uh, Tim Hortons and so on and so forth. We are also, the next area, which we're gonna be launching uh, very, very soon is um, uh, textile. So in the UK, we're launching a textile play for Loop, uh, uh, infant to new, a newborn to infant clothing. And in uh, the US, uh, uh, reusable diapers. So that's sort of textile. And we think that there's a huge amount of, oh, we also have B2B that we're launching in France. So like food service, think like your, you know, 10 pound tub of mayonnaise or your industrial cleaner for custodial services and so on and so forth. Now, where we think reuse is appropriate is three things. First, the shorter the time from the moment you purchase an object to, moment, to the moment it's waste. Not how, not how often you buy it, but the time between purchase event and waste event. So if you say, let's say you have a high-end Swiss watch versus a coffee cup. Well, the coffee cup is going to become waste maybe in 20 minutes. That Swiss watch may not become waste for generations. So the coffee cup is more relevant. The second factor is, is there an opportunity to improve design? The Swiss watch probably is already at the pinnacle of its design, while the coffee cup, massive opportunity to improve design. 
so coffee cup more relevant. And the third is a weird one is, is there a stakeholder who is upset about that object as a waste stream? No one's really complained, I'm sure, ever to you about luxury Swiss watch litter, right? Probably never has ever come up, but people are really pissed off about coffee cup waste. And the more, they don't all have to index true, but the more those three things index true, the more relevant for reuse. So kind of, I love this analogy of the difference between the purchase event, the purchase date or, and the, you know, the waste date or the waste event. Yes. And so if we think, uh, we'll use QSR as you talked about. So yes. a lot of what we buy at restaurants uh, is not might be technically recyclable, it's not economically recyclable and viably yeah. recyclable in North America. Like a lot of uh, plastic containers, you know, at, co at coffee places are yes. type five plastics, they don't get. So how do you, is, is that where you kind of get them on board, uh, get these stakeholders to understand or they're, they see the value in it from the get-go? Um, so, so the way we would like, the, you know, the, the journey, if you will, with a partner, um, uh, typically begins, you know, the very beginning is we'd say, well, if you're a coffee shop, you have non-recyclable coffee cups, let's help you collect and recycle those. Because tomorrow your coffee cup will still be the same, no matter what. Mm -hmm. Then when we've done that, then we sort of typically say, well, let's help you make that same disposable coffee cup uh, uh, with unique recycled materials. Then we say, let's move and invent a reusable coffee cup together. Now, it doesn't always go in that order, like Tim Hortons, which is a very big coffee shop, started with reuse, and we're now working on them with recycling. So it can go in any which way, but that's usually the journey. Now, what gets us in the door is yes, the problem, right? Like there's an issue to solve, but what gets the organizations excited is, is those value points I mentioned. How can they win with it? Okay. And do you, do you see this as, I mean, you talked a lot about uh, the information that they leverage or the yes. brand equity that you might get. So from a different type of pen that would get me yes. to kind of s switch to that. Uh, is that kind of the same one of the same selling points you'd see at outside industries? I mean, the B2B one uh, is a tough one for me to, to kind of see. Not, uh, not as much. So I'll give you an example. That. So we work with, uh, I'll give you a B2B example, with the infant formula brand called Bladina. It's owned by Danon in France. And this infant formula is B2B. It's only sold to hospitals so that when, you know, uh, a child is born and may have to be incubated or something, that's the infant formula that they're provided, you know, uh, in the hospital. It's a hospital right. product. Now, Bladina launched with us uh, a decade ago, recycling for those containers in hospitals and then gave it for free to the hospitals and hospitals loved it. And that became a way for them to get another hospital to switch from brand X into their brand. They would say, hey, you got two infant formulas, but this one has a recycling solution and this one doesn't. And that recycling solution put over the edge the ability for them to win the business and became a ma major market driver or with Kimberly Clark. For even well before COVID, we've done massive amounts of PPE or you know, personal protective equipment recycling, and they use that as a way to convince facility owners to choose their PPE versus the competitive PPE, right? So it plays to B2B as well. It's just different value features will come up, right? It's not going to be always exactly the same, but it works just as well behind the scenes as in front, you know, uh, uh, as front of show like B2C. Wonderful. I, I think you answered that question very nicely. So... We don't have commercials, so let's kind of take a two-minute personal break and as, ask you some personal questions if you don't sure. mind. Yeah. Uh, so you can uh, check your phone if you want, but what's the last good song that you remember listening to or that you've enjoyed listening to? Um, I really like this. Uh, just last song was Tilted by, uh, uh, God, what's the band name? Uh, Christine and the Queens. And uh, thinking about to stay on your phone for a second, uh, what is one app you cannot live without? One app I can't live without. Um, let me just see. because I've, uh, uh, I've been enjoying TikTok recently. I don't actually have an account on TikTok, but it's just fun. Uh, you know, uh, videos that, you know, you're sitting on the toilet. You can, you know, eat up two minutes really in a fun way. Wonderful. So, uh, and our, our, our last one on this, uh, do you have a favorite spice or condiment? You would say? Hands on yes. Uh, I'm a really big fan of s smoked salt. Just on top of anything? Oh, no, on anything uh, like because oh. it's it's a it's salt but it has a very smoky flavor to it and it's just okay, one of my okay. favorite like if i went to uh you know like I'd, if you said it was one uh, one spice you can or one condiment the one sort of topping that would be the one i'd you know take with me perfect lastly do you mind giving us one interesting thing people you work with or that you know typically don't know about you um that uh, i uh love doing pottery in fact i have a pottery studio in my basement oh there you go. Know a lot of people know that. So thank you for sharing. It's always nice to know uh, yeah. uh, 
our guests are nice people in addition to being great at their jobs. Uh, we'll go back and kind of talk about sustainability. I really want to fo- drive more kind of beyond TerraCycle and Loop and what you folks are doing. And if I look at, uh, try and get an objective lens at other companies. Yes. Uh, how do we go about measuring it? Like when we look at a company, company X, for instance, how do we, how would you say they're doing a good job or a poor job on something? Gosh, it's a good question because today the measurement is sort of say, well, what is it? And am I improving from that? But that's sort of a screwed up measurement because what, uh, if you're really bad and you get a little better, that's not good, right? So this is a weird thing where everyone in sustainability, it's a very convenient way to do it, says, let's measure where we are. And then we're going to say if we're good or bad by then measuring the improvement from that starting point. But what I would say is that the starting point is if your company didn't exist. And then what we have to think about, that's really the starting point, right? Before your industry existed, is what is the impact of that particular product or service's existence? And is that, is that okay? And there may be many industries that we say shouldn't exist, no matter even if they took their impact to zero, right? That's what we really have to start with because if not, uh, we're, we're sort of creating a false uh, narrative, if you will, right? This idea of, of improvement over an arbitrary starting point, right? Which is, mind you, how the carbon and, and you know, trading and plastic credit systems are, are working is they're sort of accepting the starting point is zero. But frankly, the starting, the zero point should be, well, zero, like truly, where before we started these things. I guess if I kind of push on your point a little bit, if we go, yeah. it's not the some arbitrary number. The arbitrary number should be before the company or the industry started, right? Let's use that That's as the correct. baseline, not yes. we're going to start measuring in 2020 and, oh, this is where we were. And, well, we improved over the next four, four or five years. Would that be fair? That's exactly right. Right. Like, uh, you know, if, if, if as an extreme example is if let's say you're a horrible person and you are a mass murderer and you're murdering one person a year, if you're now murdering one person every two years, it's still horrible. Even though you improved your your murder rate by 100 percent. I mean, you know what I mean? So that so is a I wonderful think, analogy. Right. We have to uh, start in that way because it may question certain industries. And this is important because today no industry Cost, co- pays the costs of its existence in full. So how do you think we can go about that? How can we get companies to truly internalize? Yeah. All their, these externalities? Their, yes. Um, well, look, corporations by definition will never do it voluntarily, all right? Um, they're only going to internalize an externality if the benefit of internalizing it outweighs the cost, which is how I convince companies to do recycling. That's internalizing an externality, but notice I have to show them how they're going to win more than the cost of internalizing the externality. Okay. Right. So voluntarily, no company will do it right in, in a pure sense that has to come from uh, citizens do, voicing their concern. And it really is the citizen that starts the process. Right. And you, we have two things we need to do. We have to voice the concern, be loud about it, complain and, and not just loud, but persistent. Right. Because companies will many times say, oh, it's going to go that, 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 that ill, you know, that, that issue will go away in the next news cycle. It has to be loud and persistent. And then we need to vote with our money for the future we want. And what we buy is an active vote for more of that object to exist. And what we don't buy is a vote for less of that object to exist. And we have to take that vote as seriously as we take our political vote. And that's how we change the world because every other stakeholder, lawmakers, uh, businesses, you know, retailers, you name it, like manufacturers, retailers, lawmakers, all these stakeholders are always reactionary to the popular demand. So it's the citizen at the center of all of this. So kind of building on that, you, right now, I mean, I'd like to think a lot of people understand uh, CO2 emissions and global warming, yes. right? That's sure. come to the forefront. Everybody sees that. But we've still got a horrible problem with waste, energy, yes. Yes. Uh, uh, water usage. And so h- how can we, uh, I guess, what can people do to, to learn more about that or better educate beyond that? I mean, you folks do a great job in waste, but uh, as a consumer who's maybe yeah. agnostic or doesn't know about it, what can, what can they do? This is one of the challenges of the environmental movement is the environmental movement is complex, right? You just mentioned, you know, a couple of examples, but there's a hundred such examples, Absolutely, you know, yeah. and they're all complicated and nuanced. And, uh, I do encourage, please read, please learn, you know, absolutely, please really, you know, get understanding on all these things. But 
you know, even myself, I've been, you know, only working on sustainability in 20 years, and there's many, you know, parts of it that I haven't researched or understand, right? And I, this is all I do. So I think the distilling simplicity of it all is every environmental problem in the world stems from one action, which is the action of buying something. Nicely said. So I'll, I'll kind of leave that on uh, that point. Right? It's that simple. There's nothing more complex to it. There is no such thing as a good purchase. Okay. So I, I guess then pushing on this. So if I'm, there is no good purchase, but I'm going to have to make a purchase. And yes. so if I'm looking at comparing, you know, product A and product B or company A and company B, whatever they are, uh, you talked about this nuanced element of sustainability and impact on the environment. Let's just stick with just impact on the environment. Uh, yes. uh, how do I know which I should, which one I should pick? I, I've still got to buy this product or I've decided okay. I want yeah. to buy this so product. I understand. Yeah, yeah. So the first thing I would do before answering the question, I say, do you actually need that product? Let's pretend yes, uh, uh, for whatever right. reason. But it's I, a I, very I, important question to ask first, But because I, I bet you 70% of your purchases, 80% of your purchases, the answer could be no. It's probably higher than that. I, I'll yes. concede to that fact, but okay. you know. All right, so uh, just to acknowledge the white elephant in the room, right? So yes. now let's go to your direct question. How do you know which is better? Um, I think, you know, if it's where I'm an expert, where I can advise is on the, what happens to it at the end of its life or how's it made, the waste part, right? Because you should think about the ingredients and all those things that will be, another guest of yours can maybe uh, help articulate on that. But on the waste component, um, here's the simplicity to think about. The best thing to do is to first buy something that is reusable or has been reused, like a used object or will be reused. Okay. So it, then there, you never have to recycle it or it never becomes trash. Even better than that, if there is no packaging. So let's say there, the packaging has been eliminated. Then is it reused or reusable, the object and the package? Then is it going to be recyclable, which means made very simply, right? That's uh, like made just from clear PET or white HTP or paper or... The, the packaging or the product are you, are you either, talking about? Either, either. Remember, both okay. become waste, right? So the packaging or the product, is it going to be easy to recycle? So the stuff where you don't have to think about, is it recyclable? But intuitively, it's recyclable, like very, very easy. Then, uh, 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 and I try to avoid everything else, frankly, from there. Okay. And and I'll concede, kind of going back to your first question, you said 70, 80%. I think that's absolutely fair. I mean, how many of us go out and buy a, another t-shirt or another pair of jeans when we've probably got two or three in the closet that still have a lot of life in, you know, you think people think, you know, they wish cycle them at the end or they think they're giving them away, but you're, you're absolutely right. They, at the end of the day, it all does most likely end up in a landfill somewhere. Uh, yeah. Growing. Yeah. No, that's right. And, uh, you know, I think the key, what's exciting though, is that an economist may tell you, oh, but that's going to destroy the economy. But I have, there's a tip, there's an opportunity on this. You could buy less and buy much higher quality than things that are going to delight you way more. Things are going to last a long time. Right. Uh, I mean, think about, you know, the idea of, quality design and timeless, you know, uh, ideas, buy things that are, you're going to, you know, you can still use 20 years later. Yeah. So you're saying, you know, if I'm still going to spend, I was still going to spend a hundred dollars on that item rather than buy three of it over the next three years, I just pay, you know, 33 for each item, just pay a hundred for the one item. Sure. And, and you got a way better item. And we, we also talk about the, the, I love how you talked about the waste and the recyclability of the waste. Uh, I paying for that packaging, right? If I pay, a, you know, whatever the item was, that's, that packaging comes in and we're seeing a lot of companies kind of going towards that where they're going down e-commerce or direct to consumer where they, they don't, they change how they spend. Yeah, man. I would of, rather like the, just don't charge me for the package. Just give me the product. And I, but a lot of consumers are down that way as well. Yeah. Is, is there specific elements you think are important to look at as companies embark on their sustainability journey? Um, yeah, it depends, you know, on the industry, right? That's why I gave pause because it really depends on the industry and every industry will have different focal points, right? Uh, on where, where, what is the most important impact of their, of, of their particular industry? Like if you're buying, you know, chicken, it's not the packaging that's the biggest impact, it's the agriculture and the, uh, and the farming of chickens and so on. And so each industry is going to be slightly, uh, slightly different on, on where, you know, to overall focus. As it pertains to the topic of circular economy, the thing to think about is what happens with that object when it hits its end of life? And how did you create your object to begin with? And are you ideally making it from waste? Because that's how nature works. Nature is ultimate recycling. Every single thing is, uh, is recycled. I mean, we eat animals and plants. Those eat plants. The plants eat dirt. And the dirt was some animals, you know, poop or, you know, fallen leaves. It's all, we're all converted poop really in the end, right? Literally. And so 
nature has perfect circular economy, that's what we need to be echoing in the human system. Perfect answer. So we can kind of shift to our last few set of questions, if you don't sure. mind. And this is a two part question. If we think about people who are trying to get into the field of sustainability, maybe people early on in their career or just kind of started a few years ago, what advice do you have for them to get into sustainability, whether it's at their own company, maybe that doesn't really get involved in sustainability or a company kind of sure. like TerraCycle or Loop that has a sustainability vision? I think the biggest lesson I can say, whether you're an entrepreneur, you know, like at your own company or extrapreneur uh, or entrepreneur, like we are, you know, uh, influencing from the outside is empathize. You're going to have to convince someone to do something, right? You're going to have to go talk to someone and say, Hey, someone, could you please do this great idea? That's going to make, you know, the world better, right? No matter what, you're going to have to be in that mode of convincing someone to do something purposeful. Don't lead with this is do this because it's the right thing to do. Instead, empathize with the actor right? What's going to make them happy? What are they focused on? What's going to give them their bonus? What's going to, you know, and you may not at all even agree with that. You may even disagree with it, right? And so, but you have to empathize, which isn't just understanding, which means really appreciating and walking in their shoes and centering on that's their goal, whatever their goal may be as simple as I want to sell more shampoo, right? And then show them how they can achieve that by doing your purpose, and if you do that well, then they're going to make it phenomenally big, and it's going to flourish even if you don't uh, even if you don't tend it, right? It's sort of like planting a seed. You want to put a plant that's going to enjoy the surroundings you're planting it in. Then it's going to flourish and take over. If you put a, a plant in an area that it's going to struggle to live, you're going to have to keep watering it, keep helping it, and then at some point, the moment you turn your back, it's going to die. And that's the same thing uh, on this. You have to really, you know, empathize with your surroundings and lean in on that with your purpose. I, I really, I think you've summarized that wonderfully. I like the empathize. I, we, I, when I kind of go in and we look at sustainability from a business perspective, I always tell people to think, remember, the business is exists to make more money. And so if you come up with a solution that helps them lower their costs, increase their profitability, like energy reduction or en energy preservation, uh, in, don't, this is not good. Let's not talk why it's good for the environment. Let's talk about how this is good for lowering your electricity bill totally. and how you're going to make more money at a company. So and that works very quickly. Yep. Perfect. So I really like the empathize. Do you think that advice, uh, do you have advice for people maybe who are a little bit more senior in their career, uh, mid-career, who kind of, they've been out from the workforce for a little bit longer. How can they kind of get involved in the sustainability bandwagon? I think they, the key thing, whether, I mean, frankly, whether you're, you know, end career, mid-career, or you're just a kid starting out, just start. Okay. Right. I think there's too much thinking. There's too much exploration, too much like academic just pick a topic you're passionate about, center on that, and then just start enabling it and the world will tell you what to, you need to learn. Perfect, just start enabling it. So now yeah. we, I wanna focus in on advice maybe that you might give to uh, the entrepreneurs. So a company that doesn't see the light, doesn't see the value add of sustainability, where yes. uh, what, can, what can they do? Uh, what can people start to have really drive an impact to, ch to yeah. change this where we I, ha I think you have three three tools you can leverage and they're all powerful one is fear fear that you're going to be legislated fear that you're going to be you know uh, left behind you know like all the negatives that come if you don't lean in on sustainability the second is uh, uh jealousy right where your competitors what are your competitors doing and you know are you gonna are, are they gonna beat you at your own game because they're, they're leaning in on sustainability and the third is is the most powerful of all of those because those other two are sort of negative emotions right fear or jealousy those are not positive emotions the third is the biggest which is where you should put all your effort is how you can step ahead and and win and lead right you know that's a very sort of altruistic emotion and those are the three tools you have and i would leverage all three i you know think about all three of those um and then another very important thing is start with bite-sized chunks, like something you can execute and celebrate, celebrate being the more important part within the 90 day window, even if it's small, then that gives you permission to do something in a 180 day window. Then that gives you permission to do something in a bigger window, because many times these companies set these goals, like in 10 years, we're going to be totally different. They never make them. We've tracked these goals for 20 years and people generally fail because they're too far out. They're not split into these very bite-sized pieces that the company can eat and then upgrade. 
Wonderful. Thank that. I won't add anything to that. Uh, moving on to kind of, we think a lot about corporate social responsibility, what yes. companies can be doing, how they can be doing it. But I, I really like want, want us to think for a second about personal social responsibility, you know, PSR. And that's, you, you, you said it really was just buy less. And we think about, oh, I'm going to buy 5%, 10%. I like your example. I'm going to buy, you need to buy 70, 80% less to really kind of change that. Are, are, are there kind of specific things you can think beyond that? So we can think about when I think about myself as an individual to have a better impact? Yeah. Um, so I think by far that's the biggest and by the hardest. I struggle with it myself. Like I'm not perfect at this and it's a great struggle, right? So I'm uh, also acknowledging that it's incredibly hard uh, to buy less, but that is by far the biggest. And buying less is everything. Travel less, you know, drive less miles, right? You know, eat less impactful food, eat uh, plant-based diets instead of meat-based or fish-based diets, you know, like the big thing on, you know, uh, uh, fishing is one of the biggest destructors, uh, the things that destroy the ocean and, and create climate change and all these things. The answer isn't eat sustainable fish, it's don't eat fish, right? Like that's the answer. And so that to me is it's, it's where can one reduce their impact, right? Because we are right now living lives that are massively more impact than ever before. And that's what we need to focus on is where can we reduce impact? Now, that sounds like a very like, you know, like you're going to be a monk and so on. But there's an easier way to do this. How can you achieve happiness in other ways than shopping? And there's many ways to achieve happiness, like go see a concert, go, you know, uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, enjoy art, enjoy people, enjoy things that are not uh, accumulation of objects. And I love kind of this idea you talked about understanding impact. I think that's one of the biggest thing when people step back and think of the product they're buying and the true impact that it has. Uh, that's really where they start to see change. Uh, yeah. I want to thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate all your insight and information that you've shared. At the end, is there anything, parting thoughts you want to leave us with, Tom? No, I mean, I really appreciate your time and your questions. And thank you, everyone who's listened. Um, and hope this has been a, 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 a fun discussion to observe. Perfect. Thank you very much, Tom, and have yourself a wonderful day. You as well. Thank you. Thank you.